Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. The number of attendees is still creeping up slightly, so I'll talk very slowly. And hopefully by the time we start our presentations, everybody who wants to join us will be here. So to start by introducing myself, I'm Charlotte, I'm Patient Advocacy Manager at the UK charity Leukemia Care. And I'm chairing today on behalf of Leukemia Care and also the co-organisers, um, the Acute Leukemia Advocates Network. So it's delighted to be helping out. Um, just to say a few things about uh, today's session. Um, so we are hoping to share some uh, hot off the press knowledge, some latest knowledge that you may not find in, say, uh, booklets written for the newly diagnosed patients. Um, in light of that, we might not be able to cover everything that has been published in journals and conferences. Um, as you can imagine, that's very difficult to do in an hour, but we do welcome questions on any topics in the chat and we will do our best to address them. Just to be clear, we are um, talking to a global audience today. Um, so we may not be um, talking about things that are specifically available in your country. And if you need to talk to someone about the relevance of the information, please reach out to Leukemia Care if you're in the UK, um, to Alan if you're an international person, or um, do obviously speak to your doctors if you are um, a patient yourself. We will assume some basic understanding of some concepts in AML, but again, please don't feel afraid to ask if you don't understand anything we are saying at any point. And we will record the session so you can re-listen to things or review the slides in your own time and put it on YouTube. And finally, we also um, will um, not be able to take personal medical questions through this format. Um, that's just not possible. Um, for us to do in, in this kind of session. So hopefully that um, clears uh, what we are talking about today. I'm really excited to be joined by two fantastic speakers. Um, one is Mike. Mike, would you mind introducing yourself for me? Yeah, hello. Thank you for that uh, introduction, Charlotte. I'm uh, Mike Dennis. I'm a consultant haematologist um, based in Manchester in, in uh, the UK. And I've got a particular interest in the treatment of patients with acute myeloid leukemia. Great, thank you. And hopefully we've also got Anne Pierre with us. Oh. Hiya. Sorry about this. <laughs> That's okay. I'm Anne yeah. Pierre. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm an acute leukemia, a French acute leukemia um, patient advocate. Um, I'm a member of the steering committee of the Acute Leukemia Advocates Network I'm based in Paris. Great, thank you. Look forward to hearing your thoughts. So we're going to start with a presentation from uh, from Mike about sort of his perspectives on what's sort of new in, in AML, in its treatment, in its genetics, in, in lots of different areas. So I'm really excited to hear Mike's sort of perspective on what's changed and perhaps what's not. So Mike, I'll hand over to you for your presentation when you're ready. Great, okay. Thank you, Charlotte. Just bring my slides up, hopefully. So, um, a nerving moment. So, I believe, can you see my slides? Yep, they've just popped up. Yeah, they've just popped up. So, this has been um, a wonderful invitation. Uh, hopefully, we'll have an exciting hour. Um, you know, my talk really is 30 minutes going through some of the backgrounds of uh, acute myeloid leukemia in terms of diagnostic approaches and specifically looking at treatment when patients are newly diagnosed with the disease. Uh, it was difficult to know exactly what the sort of knowledge base was from everybody who's attending the, the webinar. So please, I apologize if uh, things are too basic and similarly, apologize if, if things at times seem too complex but you know I think that's really what the uh, session at the end for further discussion will be all about. So I'm going to talk about the standard approach really focusing on the uh, licensed therapies and you'll have to excuse me being a UK based haematologist my extensive knowledge and experience is in UK based management but clearly in my role, I'm sort of conscious of um, what the 
treatment spectrum is within North America and also across Europe, where it wouldn't surprise you to know things are not dramatically different, treating the same disease in fairly similar healthcare settings as well. And then I, you know, I, I guess there was a, a particular request to sort of think about some of the new and exciting developments in terms of the treatment of acute myeloid leukemia, um, which have been showcased at the various uh, meetings and uh, the senior journals over the last year or two. When patients are diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia, you'll know that this can present in a whole spectrum of ways. For some people, it's a slow insidious onset of feeling increasingly tired and lethargic, whilst at the other end of the spectrum, there can be a sudden development of um, hemorrhagic or bleeding complications, or more commonly, problems of infection and sepsis. And so this should prompt either by your GP or healthcare professional or attendance to the hospital for evaluation for the medical and nursing teams to undergo some initial blood tests. And that initial blood count, for any of you um, who've been diagnosed with uh, AML will know this becomes a bit of a lifeline in terms of understanding exactly what's going on. But this is the basic of all blood tests that really evaluates the bone marrow function. It's looking at the uh, production of red blood cells, the production of white blood cells, and the production of platelets. And any of these um, levels might be reduced in patients who are diagnosed with AML, largely as a consequence the disease originates within the bone marrow, progresses within the bone marrow and leads to bone marrow failure, so a reduction in production of the uh, normal blood cells. Abnormalities that are seen in the blood count would immediately lead the uh, team in the laboratory to actually have a look at the blood under the microscope, what's called a blood film. And this slide is a representative slide of a patient who had acute myeloid leukemia. You can see that the pink are small cells are the red blood cells. The large cells, the abnormal ones, are the ones that are the leukemia blasts. So within minutes of um, the blood being in with the laboratory, in theory, uh, it could become apparent that a patient has acute myeloid leukemia. One of the, the cells sort of in the middle um, appears to have a sort of a large granule. It's a thing called an hour rod. And that's something that really is pathognomonic of uh, a diagnosis of acute myeloid leukemia. And then in other areas uh, around this, this schedule, the things that, that look like they're just dirt, but they are in fact the bullets. Next tests to be done would be um, genetic tests. And the first one would be to look at the cytogenetics or the chromosomal analysis. This is quite a specialist technique that's been uh, in operation for a number of decades. And it, it guides in relation to acute myeloid leukemia as to certain genetic abnormalities associated with a good prognosis or conversely with a bad prognosis. And there's computer software that allows the cells uh, when they're undergoing mitosis, the chromosomes divide, can be stained. And um, sequence here in terms of the largest chromosome, number one, through to the smallest chromosome 22 with the X and Y chromosomes. Now on this slide, there are very helpful arrows, chromosome 15 and 17. What this is trying to show you is that the right hand chromosome 15 is slightly longer than the left hand one. Whereas with chromosome 17, it's slightly shorter than the left-hand one. And this is a very characteristic change that occurs with a balanced translocation between chromosome 15 and 17, which is associated with acute promyelocytic uh, leukemia, one that uh, a, a treatment that has very specific therapy in terms of management. Mike, sorry to interrupt. Your um, audio is a little bit stilted. I think your internet connection is poor. I wondered whether turning your camera off while you're presenting might help. Sorry to interrupt you. That's great. Let's see how that goes. Thank you. Let's see how that goes. So that initial cytogenetic analysis uh, requires um, the cells on to undergo mitosis so there are additional tests here, which is called fluorescein in situ hybridization, where you're able to just immediately stain the uh, chromosomes within each individual cell with a, a characteristic diagnostic paint. This example here is showing that chromosome uh, 17 has got a green paint and chromosome 15 has a red paint. Now they should never be together, 
And so you can see on the two cells on the right hand side with the yellow arrows, they're showing what's called a fusion signal, which again is showing this balanced translocation of exchange of material between chromosomes 15 and 17, again, showing a particular form of acute myeloid leukemia. That sort of information has guided us, and this has been an update from what's called the European Leukemia Net, uh, essentially uh, a collaboration of European experts who have um, extended knowledge of acute myeloid leukemia to evaluate what type of acute myeloid leukemia you have. I mean, you may think that AML is all the same, but in fact, virtually every patient's AML is in some ways different. But it is uh, now universally sort of categorized into sort of three different groups which would guide you in terms of treatment. First group, obviously, being the, the favorable group. And this would be with specific mutations by such genetics for the translocation between chromosomes 8 and 21 or in version 16. And then there are a couple of uh, molecular mutations there, NPN1 on its own without a FLT3 mutation or a BZIP in frame mutation of CBP alpha. I don't think you need to worry too much about the detail, but essentially to say fav favorable patients um, respond very well to treatment and don't usually require allogeneic transplant. At the other end of the spectrum, there are a variety of cytogenetics and molecular abnormalities that indicate a disease that's unlikely to respond immediately to uh, initial chemotherapy. And even if it does respond to initial chemotherapy, it's very likely to relapse. And so for patients that are in the adverse group of, of uh, AML, they almost always will require allogeneic transplant to have a realistic prospect of long-term disease-free survival or cure. So the bone marrow trephine, uh, which is basically the biopsy that, that is done on the, the patient at the time of diagnosis, would show this dense infiltration of a tumor, basically, of the acute myeloid uh, blast cells. Once chemotherapy has been administered and you start to see the blood counts go low, the bone marrow would be empty and then the blood counts start to recover and you have another biopsy done, usually around about a month after starting the chemotherapy, you would see this sort of appearance within the bone marrow. And this is a, a normal looking bone marrow to find with fat spaces and a whole variety of different blood cells, which are normal generating platelets. So over the last five years, there's really been something of an explosion in terms of new treatments that are available. And the nature of this is usually that um, there'd be large clinical trials that would be undertaken that would show that the treatments were of benefit uh, compared to standard of care. And then would obviously be uh, evaluated in the US by the FDA or in Europe by the EMA to determine whether the uh, benefit as determined by meeting primary endpoint often the clinical trial would be seen as of clinical benefit to patients. And then beyond that within the UK, and I, I think it's fairly similar in many other countries, that you then need the commissioning or, or funding bodies um, of the healthcare setting to agree to fund uh, treatments that have then been approved. And you can see we've quite a large list here. Um, at the top, there's Midostorium, which is a targeted FLT3 inhibitor that's given in combination with intensive chemotherapy, widely used and now standard of care. There's Gemtuzumab, Ozogamycin or myelotarg, which is a, an antibody conjugate with chemotherapy that's effective in most patients with acute myeloid leukemia. It doesn't appear to work in those who have adverse cytogenetic abnormalities. Next one is the CPX351, which is Vixios. This is like an alternative form of the conventional dornarubicin and cytarabin therapies. Venetoclax, the BCL2 inhibitor, and I'll talk a bit in more detail uh, about its utilization, which has mostly been in the context of patients not fit for intensive forms of chemotherapy. Uh, but clearly, it's been a, a huge change for us in the last couple of years. There's targeted treatment in terms of gilteritinib, which again is a, a FLT3 inhibitor that's approved and used in the, the relapse setting for patients who have this FLT3 mutation. Now, at the end of last year, um, CC486 or on your reg is a treatment that's been 
approved and NICE approved uh, to be used for patients who've had intensive chemotherapy but not undergone allogeneic transplant as a way of maintaining remissions. And I've just realised actually this slide is out of date that the ivocytinib, the IDH1 inhibitor, was approved uh, in Europe in February combined with azacitidine um, but not yet commissioned for use in this rare subgroup of patients with acute myeloid leukemia. So this is how we would approach uh, a patient at the time when they're originally diagnosed. First day of presentation, it really is about the question of confirming the diagnosis by looking at blood and bone marrow, as discussed. Within the working week, you'd want to have a genetic understanding about um, the disease, so that could guide you about specific targeted treatments and also what the likely prognosis is and whether transplant may, re may be required. And that comes down to that searchiness. Analysis and the limited of molecular mutations. And then what's going treatment um, with induction chemotherapy during that three, four week period, a more extended evaluation of um, the other mutations would, would be undertaken. So within the case diagnosed with acute promyelocytic leukemia, APML, arsenic trioxide is the standard therapy. Patients who have a very high risk form of the disease to have a more, uh, a more intensive initial therapy with, which incorporates idorubicin with ATRA. The CBF, which stands for core binding factor leukemia, uh, the international standard care is very much this dornarubicin with cytarabin arabinoside, often referred to as DA, and then go the myel, the, which is the myelotarg therapy. Core binding factor is about 10% of patients with AML. FLT3 mutated patients are about 25% of patients with AML, and they would have the DA with the targeted mitostorin therapy. More commonly in the older patients, over 60, I don't know, that seems quite young to me, you know, over 60, but uh, it's often referred to as being older. They may have liposomal therapy, which has been demonstrably superior in this, these particular subsets of uh, transformed AML or AML with myelodysplastic related changes. One of the key considerations really is, is somebody fit enough to undergo intensive chemotherapy? Those of you who've been through the treatment would know generally it's a six weeks to the hospital, 10 days of intensive chemotherapy, inevitable instances of um, sepsis and infection and regular blood transfusional support. And most patients up to the age of 70 are usually capable of receiving such therapy, particularly if they haven't got other significant medical conditions. And these slides are taken from our most recent UK study, the AML-19 trial, and it shows you that for the vast majority of patients, survival is in excess of 50%, but sadly, it's really only around about 65% of patients that are potentially cured by having various intense approaches. You may know that the average age of getting AML is 65, um, and a, a significant proportion of patients are considerably older than that. And so there's been a lot of interest in recent years about treatments that could be given to people who can't receive intensive therapy, either due to age or more commonly comorbidity, other medical conditions that mean that having the intensive treatment would be seen as dangerous. And so you can see survival curves here are far less encouraging with long-term survival at two to three years of being only around about 30% with what we believe to be the best treatment this venetoclax with azacitidine. But certainly it's an improvement on what was done previously. And the average age of patients going into this trial uh, was around about 75. Clearly there's a need for us to improve upon outcome significantly in that patient group. I just want to quickly go through um, a presentation from our group that was presented at the ASH meeting uh, in the US at the end of last year. Uh, really Evaluating, you can see that patients that go into a clinical trial, nearly 2,000 patients with AML went into this trial. That's from the UK, Denmark, New Zealand, um, predominantly. And the idea was to compare the standard chemotherapy, DA, with a more intensive chemotherapy called FLAG-IDA. We'll see it on the right-hand side. And to consider about whether one or two doses of the um, antibody Marlatag would be required uh, to control the disease most effectively. Patients are around about 55, 
and you can see the variety of mutations and, and genetic abnormalities that I've mentioned before. In terms of response rates, and this is increasingly what we see for patients who are treated with intensive therapy, more than 90% of patients will respond to treatment. This is always now a problem with acute myeloid leukemia, that relapse is really the issue. Patients often respond in a timely manner. And you can see here that the mortality or the, the risk of dying at either one or two months is pretty low, not insignificant, uh, being somewhere around about three to four percent. And this is really the reason why patients are kept in hospital throughout that period of time to make sure that that um, possibility is absolutely minimized with um, treatment of the absence of blood products and um, uh, timely use of um, antimicrobial treatment, antibiotics and antifungal therapies. So I mentioned before how all AML is somewhat different. You can see there's a breakdown here in the pie chart of the various molecular abnormalities that commonly occur in patients with acute myeloid leukemia. If we look at patients who have this CBF or core binding factor leukemia, this is patients who have generally good risk disease. You can see that if you are given this dornarubicin cytarabine with one dose of myelotarg therapy, the three-year survival in that group of patients was 97%. Uh, whereas in the other groups, it's uh, significantly lower, but still quite acceptable. So you can understand how that has now globally become the standard of care for, for that group of patients. The MPM1 mutated group tend to have a good response to therapy as well. You can see on the top right hand side that flag IDA appears better than the, the standard therapy. And we can draw a similar conclusion when we're looking at the FLIT3 mutated group. So reasonable assumptions at the end of a study like this would be that flag IDA with milder TARG would seemingly be the standard of care. And certainly there's a discussion that uh, in this particular group, subgroups of patients with AML, that's the treatment they should receive going forward. I mentioned before that relapse is a key issue and you can see here, this is data that's generated across Europe um, from the European Bone Marrow Transplant Registry. And it shows that of all the diseases and reasons why people have uh, a bone marrow transplant, acute myeloid leukemia uh, equates to about 40% of the indications and is the most common reason for people having an allergenic transplant. On the left-hand chart, you can see that year on year on year, the numbers of transplants that have been undertaken are ever increasing. The type of transplant varies tremendously. Um, on the far right hand side, you'd have a transplant with 12 gray TBI as the top right with cyclophosphamide. So it's very intense in terms of radiotherapy and chemotherapy uh, in the red. And then on the far left, you can have transplants where it's a true reduced intensity, where just tiny doses of radiotherapy are actually administered. Clearly, the more intensive treatments uh, are usually geared towards patients with higher risk disease and who are younger and fitter and the reduced intensity treatments generally where the patient is only just able to uh, undergo the complications of a transplant. Relapse after transplant remains a massive issue and there have been a number of trials that have been done uh, globally. We've done one within the UK, one called the Amadeus study that's recently recruited um, it, all patients that's using the oral azacitidine treatment and we'll wait with interest in terms of how that's managed. Generally, for patients who have specific mutations, uh, there are recommended maintenance therapies to be given post-transplant. But it's somewhat disappointing that giltaritinib, only just a couple of weeks ago, it was announced that their large phase three study, so that's a, a trial that's done where half of the patients are given the active drug and half not, uh, was unable to uh, show a survival benefit for people getting, giving this highly potent, highly specific FLT3 inhibitor post-allergenic transplant. So clearly there's significant work and uh, further developments that are required in terms of strategies to prevent relapse post-transplant. Metaclax with azacitidine is a really effective treatment in terms of achieving good responses, but durability is a concern, again, particularly in this FLT3 mutated group. And so there's been great interest about combining drugs like this gilteritinib. And here you can see there was a presentation from Nick Short from the MD Anderson in the US, 
showing that in newly diagnosed patients who had this triplet, three drugs added together, there was a response rate of 100%, and that the overall survival rate at six months remained very, very encouraging is, indeed. So there are a number of trials ongoing to evaluate whether this is a, a good approach um, for patients, perhaps who are not so able to tolerate conventional intensive forms of chemotherapy. Actually attending the um, American Society of Hematology meeting, which is undoubtedly the meeting where any new or exciting data would be revealed. Often there's a thought that new and exciting data would be a new drug or a, you know, a, a transforming situation uh, with a new way of, of, of treatments, but sometimes less is more. I thought there's this very interesting presentation from the French group showing that um, in a relatively small number of patients that looking back to see whether dramatically reducing the number of days of venetoclax from the conventional 28 days to just seven days, uh, they were able to demonstrate for, in their group of patients who would have gone on to the, the uh, licensing trial of the VRDA study, uh, the outcomes in terms of responses and survival were just the same for patients that were given seven days as opposed to 28. So there are further trials that are, uh, that are being done here to confirm these findings, because uh, clearly this could translate into quite a significant improvement in terms of quality of life for patients undergoing such therapy. It's quite a nice review for anyone interested in, and thinking in terms of the various complexities of acute myeloid leukemia, the uh, various targeting treatments that, that could be undertaken. Many uh, other blood cancers like lymphoma and myeloma have been transformed by what are called bispecific antibodies, where there's a ability to engage the patient's own immune system or T cells, or increasingly commonly um, CAR T treatments, uh, which is the uh, chimeric antigen receptor type based treatment, which many of you will have heard quite a lot about. This is where the patient's own T cells are removed, genetically engineered to recognize the cancer, and then given back to them. Unfortunately, at this time, any studies that have been done in relation to acute myeloid leukemia have not been successful uh, because the, the targets that you find on the uh, myeloid leukemia cells are actually also present on all the early uh, white blood cells that ultimately become neutrophils. So CAR T therapy in AML patients always leads to prolonged, severe, continued neutropenia, and ultimately that leads to the inability to fight infection. So patients within those studies have sadly uh, succumbed to infection. But there are a number of targeted treatments that we can look at um, from a cellular level where uh, specific therapies could be very important. And one area that's been of particular interest is understanding that venetoclax works in the older patients with acute myeloid leukemia. What would happen if you combine it to intensive forms of chemotherapy? And this was a presentation by Patrick Revel, again from the ND Anderson, showing that by giving venetoclax with uh, what they call a clear regimen, which is just a combination of intensive chemotherapy similar to what's used globally. And you can see that response rates um, are 96%. They're exceptionally high. But this data is relatively early in terms of knowing what the longer term outcome potentially would be. In recent years, targeted treatments of IDH1 and 2 and FLT3 have, have, have led to uh, a licensing and, and incorporation into clinical practice. So what's the next um, area that uh, is of particular interest? Well, these menin inhibitors are active, again, for two different forms of acute myeloid leukemia. Those who have a um, mixed lineage leukemia or MLL KMT2A rearrangement, which is a relatively rare abnormality, or for those who have a nuclear phosmin 1 mutation. And there were two such agents, uh, Ravumenib and uh, Ziftamenib, which were presented at the, at the ASH meeting and really do look very interesting. These are oral tablets where in the relapsed refractory setting, response rates are around about 30%, which for just taking tablets, quite incredible uh, for people who've already been heavily pre-treated, often having had transplants in the past as well. And the side effects are relatively well tolerated. And so there are a number of trials using these drugs increasingly thinking about incorporating them with other forms of conventional chemotherapy. 
as a means of uh, achieving second remissions and ultimately enabling further transplants if the patient already hasn't had a clinical transplant. The other drug that's particularly of interest, and this is a study that's ongoing globally called Enhance 3, is using what's called a checkpoint inhibitor or an antibody against CD47. It's called magrolimab, and you can see the design of the study where patients who are newly diagnosed are randomized to either receive the standard care, which I was talking to you about before, venetoclaxase or cytidine with a placebo, randomized against this drug, magrolimab. And in our world of acute myeloid leukemia, this seems to be a strategy that's of incredible interest at the moment. So I think this is my final slide. I'm encouraged to see that I've not hugely run over time, um, but I wanted to reinforce the idea that the major thing initially is to evaluate the underlying disease and the impact it has on the patient. So it, are, is the patient young enough and fit enough to have intensive forms of chemotherapy? And does the biology of their underlying leukemia indicate that they may be specific targeted therapies like mitostorin or myelotarg that could be of interest? Similarly, are there features which are adverse and giving us a concern that relapse is, is very likely and therefore transplant would be important? And then, as I say, phenetoclax is very much pivotal to uh, the treatments for the patients that are not able to receive intensive forms of therapy. And I think we've got a long way to go in terms of strategies that could be incorporated to combine with venetoclax-based treatments so that more of those patients could be cured. You can see I've mentioned here durable responses with IDH1 and 2 and MPN1. They're relatively rare abnormalities in older patients with acute myeloid leukemia, but for those patients, they're likely to be cured uh, with venetoclax-based therapies. So I think I'll pause there and... Um, stop sharing my slides and hand it back to Charlotte and um, hopefully we'll have some discussion. Thanks very much Mike, that was a, a really great assessment of, of where we're at with AML and uh, a, a lot of things ongoing is, is what I took from that in the main which would be uh, interesting to see how things go over the years. Um, there's been a couple of questions clarifying slides before we go to Anne, yeah so um, on slide 10, you showed how you, um, uh, at what points you do diagnostic tests, very di very various diagnostic tests, sorry. Um, and someone was wondering, um, at what point does testing for TP53, IDH1 and IDH2 come into that? Was it sort of uh, in the whole genome sequencing later on in the day 21 bit, or was it is it earlier than that? Yeah, currently it's in the day 21 bit in that, um, you know, from the UK perspective, we're not able to access any TP53 or IDH1 or two um, specific therapies in that initial month. Um, you know, it's a discussion point that's come up, you know, particularly within the US, there's been the idea that it would be worthwhile knowing whether somebody is IDH1 mutated, where they could have ivocytinib with the um, azacitidine as opposed to venetoclax. But, most US uh, clinicians feel that, um, that venetoclax with azacitinine is probably a more effective and more durable treatment. And so, you know, identifying the IDH1 mutation uh, a number of weeks later for the vast majority of patients is, is entirely reasonable. I mean, we do have concern about TP53. Um, you know, this is a tumor suppressor gene that when mutated, uh, always uh, indicates a, a, an adverse form of cancer. And it's not just an acute myeloid leukemia, it's in all forms of cancer. And so people are interested in screening so that such patients might be able to access clinical trials. And so there can be specific screening that's done in relation to a clinical trial to identify patients who have TP53 mutation within a week, within a working week. But Conventionally, uh, you, you often wouldn't know in somebody who's newly diagnosed until three or four weeks have passed. It's just the, the time that it takes for the next generation sequencing to be done. Great, I hope you. my sound is working with my camera now. Yes, it seems much better now. Yeah, but for me anyway, but please do uh, those in the audience say if, if you can't hear Mike uh, particularly well. Um, and, and a similar question um, on slide 17, which you presented a pie chart of um, the distribution of various mutations among AML patients. Um, 
the the person noted that again TP53 IDH1 IDH2 are not not specifically noted are they in the other section are they rare and that's why they're not there yeah they are in the other category um as part of that analysis i mean it, in a younger group of patients with acute myeloid leukemia i mean tp53 will occur in around about 10 percent of patients idh1 in about seven percent idh2 in around about 12 percent of patients great thank you for clarifying and I think final question before I bring Anne Pierre in. Um, you obviously mentioned the triplet of a society team, venetoclax and gilteritinib or gilteritinib. Um, I'm never quite sure how you pronounce that one, um, you know, with a good response rate. But do you know anything about the safety profile? Because obviously, as patients, you often wonder more drugs, does it bring more side effects? Yeah, and that, that has been the concern with the triplet regimen in that um, all of those drugs cause neutropenia. So as um, the studies have been ongoing, there's been a need to refine the dosing schedule. And ultimately, th this has led to significant dose reductions, particularly in relation to the gilteritinib. So I think work is still ongoing to clarify exactly what the optimal combination would be. Um, but, you know, the, the, even with the dose attenuation or dose reduction, the response rate remains exceptionally good. And, and the durability or the depth of uh, the responses still continues to look very favorable. Great, thank you. So uh, we've had a few more questions come in, but they're sort of picking up on some themes that you mentioned. So before we do that, I do want to give Anne Pierre a chance to sort of respond um, to your presentation. So Anne Pierre, I mean, um, you are a patient advocate. You, you've been involved in not only the world of being a patient, but very close to, I assume, a lot of this data. Do you, what was your assessment of what's new and exciting in AML? Do you have anything to add to what Mike shared with us today? Sure. Um, no, it's been interesting to sort of see this um, sort of trend over the five years. So uh, up until 2018, I mean, AML, I mean, patients with AML um, had very few options. So there were, the metanies were extremely high um, versus, versus other, you know, blood cancer. And so there was, there was not much. Um, and since, as um, Mike mentioned, you know, um, since 2018, now we have more and more options and it's really great. And as we have more and more options and we know more about the disease, we realize how fragmented um, the community is in terms of, you know, um, which treatment to, is adequate for specific patients. And I think this is really key for the acute um, leukemia community to understand is that the treatment that one is given is not going to be, you know, cannot be transposed to another patient because one would have, would be fit, the other would be unfit, there will be different mutations and all these different specificities, and, and this is only two criteria, there'll be other criteria that would decide which treatment pathway the patient will go. I mean, this is something that, you know, patient advocates have been more informed, and then, you know, and then this is also something that we should be keen on passing on to um, AML patients that they, you know, and there's always, a, sometimes patients say, oh, but, you know, I know someone, I met someone with AML and they've got a totally different treatment to mine and it creates some anxiety, when in fact there are really good reasons for it. And, and as Mike mentioned, you know, the fact if the patient is fit and fit, the age and, and mutations and, and other factors. So, so the amenities are extremely high but what I still, you know, we welcome all these new options, but they remain high. And if I quote uh, correctly, uh, Mike, so he said that in the fit population, it's survival is about 65% of overall survival. Is that correct? And then in unfit patients, about 30%. So much better than it, what it was, but there are still a lot of issues. Um, I mean, it, it's just um, it's very uh, different to... Um, other uh, other communities, patient communities, where the uh, overall survivor will be much higher. Um, so um, one thing that I'd like to sort of stress is, you know, those patients with the uh, adverse risk profile. So those AML patients with, you know, it, we saw that slide with, you know, what the um, there was like sort of low risk or favorable risk. Like, low risk was not the exact term, then you've got moderate and adverse. And these patients often 
have very little op other option, curative option, but um, transplant. And depending on whether they fit or not fit, they will have that sort of, they can get the holy grail of transplant. But transplant is not a, a walk in the park. Transplant is hard. It's tough. It comes with side effects and complications. Um, so graft versus host disease. And in younger, in adults in, who have family projects, you know, it also means loss of fertility. So I think, and I mean, obviously, um, treating physicians and endometologists, I mean, they, they very much know that, but there's, there is definitely a focus on, on finding options that could replace transplant. So, and there's this strange relationship with transplant because a lot of patients, we want transplant. I had a bone marrow transplant. So, but it comes with, this is something you want, but this is something you fear. And because you know that you could be saved from leukemia, but you could then have the equivalent of um, some sort of um, autoimmune disease because graft versus host disease is almost like an autoimmune disease. It's your body. I mean, your immune system attacking your organs and it could be a chronic disease. So you could switch from a particular um, health status to another one. And, and you know that, so it's sort of, it's quite scary, but you want it because you feel like this is better than death, obviously. But there are other things that come to it. So I think there's a lot of hope to have something as promising in terms of survival as transplant but that would not come with all these scary, it could be scary for some, I mean, you know, graph or social TVs can, can be completely mild and manageable and will just disappear over time. But for the others, it's, it's a lifelong journey. Um, so these were my sort of initial comments. And I have a question sort of to, um, uh, to Mike is, um, to this date, there aren't any CAR T cell therapy in AML, or maybe there are, some, I mean, not that I would be regulatory approved. Is there any sort of biological reason for this, or is it because, you know, researchers have not had the chance to go into that patient community, so AML community, because there are CAR T cell therapies, so, you know, cellular therapy in, in lymphoma, in acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia, so different types of lymphoma, um, also in myeloma, but there's nothing in AML. And considering that it's the largest patient population that re would receive a bone marrow transplant, it's it's a bit, um, it's, always, it's always confused me a little. So I was wondering if you had some insight on this. Yeah, the main, the main challenge has really been uh, when one understands you know, where the disease comes from. Um, acute myeloid leukemia is really the, the myeloid stem cells. So those immature cells that are ultimately destined to become neutrophils. And you really can't live without them. And so the small number of studies that have been done in AML for CAR-T um, has led to really to, to permanent neutropenia, uh, which is not compatible with long-term survival. Um, Oh, yeah. Pretty much, pretty much all those patients die from infection. Whereas in lymphoma, um, you know, the, the 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 sort of cells that those uh, that lymphoma cells were destined to be are, are lymphocytes, um, which have a more sort of passive role in terms of um, supporting the immune system, and people can live, you know, lifelong with uh, reduced levels of lymphocytes. And so it it seems to be, you know, that, that biological issue that um, CAR T in, in AML, you can get rid of all of the, the leukemia cells, but you can't regenerate normal, healthy um, neutrophils. And so the toxicity has been a problem. There are some studies that, that are ongoing, um, uh, mostly within the US, but there are incredibly small numbers at the moment, and it's far too early to suggest that, that, that it's going to be achievable, sadly, because I think you make some really good points that, you know, uh, having a new bone marrow, having a bone marrow transplant sounds like the ideal thing when you've got a heavily diseased, um, aggressive form of cancer. But, you know, the toxicity and, and long term complications to transplant are considerable. And so really, as a community, a lot of what we're trying to do is find 
therapies that mean that you don't need to do a transplant. But unfortunately, in AML, transplant is still very much um, part of the treatment for uh, a good proportion of patients. No, thank you. That's that's really um, helpful in terms of understanding the mechanism, like how CAR T cells, you know, the fact that diseases are very different, and that that using CAR T cells would lead to permanent neutropenia. Um, I, I didn't realize this. So, uh, so there's no point at this to sort of hope for a CAR T cell in AML. Maybe another cel cellular therapy that would be using a different a different technology in the future potentially. Yeah, there's work ongoing looking at genetically modifying um, the uh, the uh, the CAR T cells so that they uh, recognize only abnormal myeloid blasts or the leukemia cells and, and not uh, normal healthy neutrophils. But uh, there's only really preclinical work that's been done on that so far. But it might be that it gets into clinical trials within the next year or two. I've heard something in Germany. There's a team doing this. Is that they're doing this sort of doing marking? Yeah. It's not paintball. Don't get me wrong. But I'm just saying it's sort of marking those cells so that the CAR T will only attack the the cells that have been marked um, by whatever process. So um, so that sounds really exciting. If that could that could be uh, introducing for for AML. Thank you both for that conversation. I think I, I totally agree with Mike and Pierre. You really encapsulated a lot of what I hear from transplant patients about, you know, the challenges around transplant. So um, I think we've nicely thoroughized um, the transplant and the CAR T space there. Just picking up on a couple of other sort of themes that are coming out of the um, the chat as well as some of the presentations. So um, genetics in AML seems like we've still got a lot to learn in that space and uh, I think I, I feel that way every time I get a presentation presented to me but is that a fair assessment Mike do we still have a lot we need to learn on on the genetics front yeah I mean I think we're always accumulating knowledge I mean some of these um, easy to recognize such genetic abnormalities have been known about for uh, um, 20 30 years um, but with the development of new genetic technologies, next generation sequencing or PCR based technologies, um, there's been the ability to understand the really the unique nature of, of people's acute myeloid leukemia. And when we've looked back at patients that have gone into clinical trials, you find that patients don't they don't have usually just have one mutation. They often have multiple mutations. Uh, they can have up, you know, perhaps even up to ten mutations. Uh, frequently, only two or three of them of the mutations are pivotal to why they generate the leukemia. But statistically, you find that, you know, the coexistence of different mutations in different patients makes their disease in many ways sort of unique to other people, and that makes it increasingly challenging to think about you know, what's the best treatment? Because you may have one mutation like nucleophosphamine one or MPM one which usually correlates to, you know, a good form of the disease, but there may be other coexisting mutations that increase the probability of relapse. And it's trying to understand that balance about which is the important driver of the disease and the, or the important target for therapy that, that would lead to the likelihood of cure and how far you need to go with treatment. And I didn't talk about it in my presentation so much, um, but I think increasingly we're sort of seeing the importance and need for very sensitive monitoring of, of response to treatment, both in terms of blood sampling and, and, and bone marrow sampling. And I know that patients hate having regular bone marrows done, um, but from our recent trials, and it, it, it should be um, presented at the ASH meeting later this year, I think we, we were able to demonstrate that having regular bone marrows, monitoring very sensitive levels of the disease that enable earlier initiation of therapy does lead to an improvement in terms of overall survival. It makes sense. You can imagine if you identify relapse at a time when it's not causing the patient any difficulties and you're able to give very specific therapy before they're experiencing the complications of infection or bleeding, um, then they do better and they're more likely to get to transplant in a safe manner. So there's some really exciting data that's coming out about monitoring. Sadly for patients, that means 
um, regular bone marrows are not going to go away. Um, I did see someone asking about uh, when the best time to have a bone marrow biopsy is during venetoclax, which I think is quite specific and not something we can deal with here, but hopefully that's answered generally their question there. Um, so I think the message, so, someone's asked um, specifically whether you're from, uh, aware of you know, drugs targeting STAG2 mutations or a, a translocation NUP98 NSD1. Um, but I think the message I got from your um, comment there was that not all of these translate, all of these mutations are going to translate into treatments and we need to learn more about all of them and not all of them will be important. Yeah, in terms of, you know, I think that was STAG2 and not 98. I mean, you know, these are, you know, relatively rare mutations in acute myeloid leukemia that occur in um, less than 5% of patients with AML. And there is a lot of research activity, you know, in terms of uh, in the Oh, we lost Mike. Oh, what a shame. Well, um, until he connects or, you know, back, I think there's an interest, I mean, very important comment also in, in the discussion is around access to bone marrow, the inequalities in access to bone marrow transplant. So there could mm -hmm. be an indication for transplant, but then issue being that not all um, patients have the same probability of finding a donor on the registry, depending on, you know, of their ethnic origin. So um, looking at US data, um, if you're white Caucasian, pr probability of finding a, a match is 79%, so someone like me. But if you're of um, Afro um, African or Afro-American origin, this drops to 29%. So, um, so this is something that, as a community, you know, we're very, we're very sort of cognizant of, and that we should really raise awareness of the need for more donors from, um, you know, from ethnic communities that are underrepresented in the registry. So, from the African continent, Asia, um, South America as well. Um, that's really, really key um, because some patients would be fit, eligible, but there's no donor. So that really is a problem. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a really, really important point. Um, a couple of charities in the UK doing a lot of work. Yeah, and to, Anthony donor. Nolan is doing fabulous work on mm. this. So yeah, absolutely. for sure. Mm. I think we might have lost Mike permanently, but perhaps you can help me, Anthea, with the final question. Um, something that struck me in the chat is the, the gentleman saying, um, I'm receiving venetoclax, but they are worried about what happens next, essentially, if it doesn't work. And I think Mike was sort of alluding to this, you know, relapse or non-durable therapies are still a big problem in AML. And he suggested actually a few different solutions. Maintenance might be one option. Um, and then we talked about transplant. Do you have a view on sort of a, a patient view on a preferred way of solving this problem? Would you prefer the first treatment to work as best as possible, even if that means it's intense? Or is a maintenance therapy something that we should develop further? Do you have any strong views on that? I think it's just so, I mean, this so personal in a way. I mean, it depends what point you are in your life, how fit you are, how, yeah, how can your body can, can take it more, any more than what it's already had? Um, what are your life goals? I mean, how's, how is everything going on? I mean, it's just so many different reasons why some patients would go for, you know, if, if consulted on these are the options, and then patients would have a say, you know, presenting with different options, different patients would just go for different, different solutions. So, um, but maybe now Mike can, can answer to these questions regarding maintenance versus curative. But as a patient, you want the first treatment to work. You don't want to go on maintenance because maintenance means that you just sort of, it's some sort of, um, you're in some sort of, transitory sort of situation where you don't know what the outcome is going to be it's very stressful um but i'll let mike maybe comment or maybe if you could repeat the question for mike if he hasn't heard it 
Absolutely. We've got a slight technical problem where Mike's in the room twice, which is creating a bit of echo. So I'm just trying to bear with me one second and I'll see if I can fix that and then we can um, bring Mike back in for the very end of the conversation, <laughs> hopefully. OK, I think I might have fixed it. Let's give it a go. Um, Mike, we were just discussing somebody uh, expressed their concern or their fear about um, what happens after treatment or if the treatment they were currently on um, unfortunately didn't work for them. Um, and I asked uh, and if you had any strong views. You, you sort of presented several options, better treatments to start with. Um, the use of maintenance. What what do you think is the most promising way of avoiding relapse at present in terms of the sort of the various options you presented earlier? Yeah, I think I'm having one or two technical issues. So we can hear I don't you. Know, tonight, maybe I you think. can can you we hear, can me? hear you. Thank okay. You. We can, yeah, we can. Yeah, do. I think one of the great, I mean, one of the key differences in um, acute myeloid leukemia compared to other forms of blood cancer really is that you get one really good chance of, um, of beating acute myeloid leukemia. So, so much of the therapy is sort of geared towards making sure that the initial therapy is, is as effective as it can be. And if it's not going to be effective, um, if it's not likely that you're going to be cured, then the idea would be to have a bone marrow or stem cell transplant. Sadly, you know, if you've had initial therapy and the disease relapses or comes back, very few patients survive from that situation. Um, the aim of that second line therapy would be to have further treatment to achieve a second remission and then to have a transplant if possible. But it is very much a minority of people um, where that would be successful. I think there are some encouraging things with um, some of the targeted treatments and some of the trials that we have, um, but the disease is one where it's best to get it right first time round, really. Great, thank you. So uh, we've come to the end of our time and I think we've um, covered as much as we can there. I hope I've... Um, address as many of the questions as I could. I, there were some sort of themes that, uh, I saw emerging, but um, we didn't quite have the time to address all the questions. Please do make sure you speak to somebody, either at a charity or an advocacy organisation or your doctor if you need further advice. Um, and obviously you can listen back to this webinar. Uh, apologies for the technical difficulties. That's the sort of nature of these things, I think. But um, Overall, we've managed to have a really good discussion. So thank you for coming. I've just got a few things to share with you um, before we end today. Um, so this slide obviously summarises nicely what the Acute Leukemia Advocates Network can, can offer its advocates. Um, uh, some really fantastic work going on, Alan, particularly in, in the research space, in my opinion, around patient preferences and things. So if you're interested, please do go have a look at that. Um, next slide, please. Um, Alan are also hosting a, a global summit. If you want to learn even more about acute leukemia, uh, that's the place to be, I think, in May. So um, yeah, do get in touch with Alan if, you, if you're interested in that. And they'll also be at the European Hematology Conference uh, in June this year as well. So lots of opportunities to get involved there. Uh, next slide, please. And then a little bit about some of the things we're doing at Leukemia Care with Alan. So we, uh, if you're interested in all types of acute leukemia, we're doing another one of these specifically to talk about uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, which Ampia is joining um, my colleague Sophie for. Um, we're also with Tobias, who is another UK doctor. So um, looking forward to, to that later in the month. Next slide, please. And then a little bit for those of you from the UK, in case you're not aware of what we at Leukemia Care can do for you directly if you're a patient. Um, we have lots of different webinars and obviously podcasts and website and newsletters and magazines. So lots of information if you do need more uh, information about your diagnosis specifically or want to hear from other people with the same diagnosis. Next slide, please. 
Um, and also lots of ways you can get support, whether that be emotional support, practical things like applying for financial help and um, those sorts of things. We can support you with most problems. So please do reach out if you if you need help. Next slide, please. A um, number of ways you can follow us online as well if you're into social media. Uh, we're on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. And I believe TikTok as well, if that's something that you are familiar with. Next slide, please. And how you can contact us. So, um, yeah, all that uh, is left for me to say really is thank you to um, Pierre and to Mike. Thank you for persevering, Mike, through your technical difficulties. Uh, it's been a really fantastic um, afternoon and we'll see you all at the next webinar soon. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.